Welcome to the Man of Recaps. This is Fear the Walking Dead full series recap. It's the first of the Walking Dead spin-off shows whose premise was to show the zombie apocalypse as it happened, you know, the fun part that Rick Grimes slept through. Our story begins in Los Angeles, where we follow the Clark family, led by Madison Clark, a no-nonsense mom who's a high school guidance counselor. Her boyfriend is the English teacher, Travis Manwa, and these two have been happily dating for a bit after Madison's first husband's death. She has two kids from her first marriage. Her daughter, Alicia, likes art and boys, but her son, Nick, is a troubled kid who's become a drug addict, and in fact, he's one of the first people to see a zombie. Reports come in of this new virus, so in this show they call the zombies infected. Most people don't understand that these infected are the walking dead, but the Clark family luckily is quick on the uptake. Travis went out to find his ex-wife and son Chris, who was at the riots in downtown. As things escalate, they seek shelter at a local barber shop run by Daniel Salazar. But as things escalate even more, they all flee downtown for the relative safety of the Clark House. Turns out the Clark House is very safe because pretty soon the military rolls up, their neighborhood is strategically located, so the military's making it their home base safe zone. And so the Clarks got really lucky. The first week of the zombie apocalypse, they're basically chilling. The Salazars are still chilling with them. Travis is like, yeah, they're my cousins. But Daniel's wife broke her ankle, and anyone who's remotely injured, they're taken away, including Nick, who's got a fever from withdrawal. The military's like, don't worry, they're fine. But Daniel Salazar lived through the Civil War in El Salvador. He knows something's up. So as his daughter, Ophelia befriends one of the soldiers, Daniel kidnaps him. It turns out he has a very dark past. He was the professional torture guy. Yeah, it seems like he's escalating a bit too quickly, but he does learn that they're losing Los Angeles, and on their way out to try to stop the spread, they're gonna kill this whole neighborhood. Over at the holding cells, Nick meets Victor Strand, an apparently rich guy who's a smooth-talking con man that befriends Nick as a potential ally. So as the base gets overrun, Nick and Strand escape while the rest of the crew comes in to save them, and they all fight their way out. But oh no, Travis's ex-wife got bit, and it's the classic zombie apocalypse thing. He's gotta put her down. Now Los Angeles is lost, but Victor Strand is a house in the hills, complete with a yacht. So in season two, as the military bombs Los Angeles as a last ditch effort to stop the spread, the Clark family and friends take to the sea on a luxury yacht, the Abigail. Uh, yeah, once again, they got real lucky. A lot of people at sea are not so lucky. Alicia's like, we gotta help them, but Victor Strand's like, sorry, boat's full. One day on the radio, Alicia meets a hot boy and tells them where the boat is because he and his friends need their help. But of course, it was a trap. They take Alicia back to their base at the harbor and are gonna kill the rest of her friends. But this crew's messing with the wrong people and immediately they break free. They negotiate a hostage exchange. Unfortunately, they killed their hostage. But the good thing about the zombie apocalypse, dead people are still able to walk around. So our crew disembarks as they make it to their destination, Victor Strand's villa in Mexico. Yeah, these Clarks got real lucky. Now it's actually Victor's boyfriend's house and unfortunately he just got bit, don't oh, know. It's his mom slash housekeeper who's in charge here now and she's doing the thing that Herschel did where she doesn't believe the zombies are really dead. So when Victor shoots his boyfriend to stop him from turning, she's real mad, gonna kick Victor and the Clark family out. But Madison Clark will do whatever it takes to protect her family. So she brings this woman down to the cellar and locks her up with the zombies. But there's another problem when Travis's son Chris is standing over their bed with a knife. Yeah, ever since his mother's death, he's become kind of deranged. And he's not the only one who's going crazy. Daniel Salazar starts hallucinating his wife who didn't make it, and for some reason he decides to burn the villa down. So as the Clarks are heading out, Nick is like, yo mom, this has kind of been a lot of family time. I'm at that age where I need to strike out on my own. Aw, oh, kids, they grow up so fast. Now early on, Nick discovered if you cover yourself in the zombie blood so you smell like the dead, they won't attack you. So now Nick walks around with the dead for protection. Yeah, he's ahead of the curve on the Whisperers. Pretty soon he's found by Luciana, who takes Nick back to her Colonia, which is a nice happy place. Nick loves it here, and Nick and Luciana get it on. The rest of the crew comes to a fancy beach resort where they broker a peace between the hotel guests and the hotel staff. Working together, they make a plan to lure all the zombies out, and now it's a really nice place to ride out the zombie apocalypse. The Clarks have lucked out once again. But anyone in the area who needs supplies has to shop at the cartel supermarket. Madison overhears her son Nick was here, so she turns on the lights at the hotel, hoping he'll find his way home. Unfortunately, that attracts everyone in the area, not including Nick, but including Travis. He and Chris went off on their own on a father-son apocalypse road trip, but soon they're joined by these douchebag frat boy spring breakers. And when they stop at a farm, Chris shoots this farmer. No mercy. Oh, he's lost. Travis is trying to get through to his son, but Chris is like, yo, dad, this has been a lot of family time. I think I need to go off on my own. All kids, they grow up so fast. Pretty soon those frat boys come to the hotel too, where apparently they were in a big crash and no, Chris died. But Travis realizes their story didn't add up and he figures out that Chris survived the crash, but because he broke his leg, he was dead weight and they killed him. So Travis goes berserk and murders these guys with his bare hands. After this, the Clarks are kicked out of the hotel. They go to Nick's Colonia, which is overrun after a fight with the cartel. Nick is leading his New Mexican family across the border for hopefully a better life in America. But turns out the border is still guarded, Nick and Luciana captured. So in season three, Madison follows Nick across the border where she and Alicia are given the warm welcome by this nice guy, Troy. But he's not so nice to the brown people in the group where he's killing them running experiments to see how long it takes them to turn. Soon Madison figures him out and attacks him. Oh, spoon to the eye, Madison. Clark, hardcore. 
But just then, another guy shows up like, whoa, sorry, that's my crazy brother. Just let him go and we'll sort this all out. Turns out they're not the military, they're from a ranch nearby, and most of them are good people, sorry about Troy. And when zombies show up, they end up separated, Travis takes the helicopter. But the helicopter's not the safer option, someone shoots at it and Travis gets hit. Oh, Travis, just when you were getting cool. So the Clarks arrive at the ranch, run by old man Jeremiah Otto. And this ranch is a great place to be. It's a doomsday prepper community, so it's incredibly well prepared. Madison's like, yo, we're gonna make this our home, and if we don't like how they're running things, we'll just take it over. The good brother, Jake, is on their side because he and Alicia immediately start dating. But Troy's a different story. He's definitely a bit of a psychopath. But in the zombie apocalypse, maybe a psychopath is exactly who you want on your side. Madison, the guidance counselor, knows how to get through to this kid, starts becoming his, like, mother figure. Nick, of course, wants to kill him, but Nick's a little bit crazy too, and these two become best friends. Luciana is still here, but the people at the ranch really don't like Mexicans, so she decides to leave the show for now. So as the ranch is searching for who shot at the helicopter, they come across one of their scouts, and it's an incredibly memorable, disturbing scene as he's still talking because the raven's picking at his brain. And so we meet Kalataka, leader of the Native American reservation, who wants the ranchers to leave because they're on our land. So in this war, because the Clarks are living at the ranch, they de facto find themselves on the ranch's side. But it becomes apparent Kalataka's the good guy. Before the zombie apocalypse, Jeremiah Otto murdered his father and got away with it. So Alicia, the optimist, tries to make peace. And who does she find here but Ophelia Salazar? She ended up crossing the border too and was taken in by Kalataka. They negotiate a hostage deal where Ophelia goes to the ranch. But the next morning, all the guards get sick. Oh, she poisoned their coffee. With her kids in danger, Madison Clark's ready to end this war. And so she kills Jeremiah Otto. Well, technically it was Nick who pulled the trigger. And so there's peace for the new generation, all gonna live at the ranch together. But even if they can all get along, it's not gonna work because the ranch is almost out of water. So they go to El Bazaar at the old football stadium, a lawless place where you can buy anything. Nick and Troy have a wild night, getting high on zombie brainstems. And who do they find here but Victor Strand, who's got a lead on a ton of water. All the water in this region comes from the dam, and Victor Strand is friends with the owner. Well, not friends so much as someone he once conned. But turns out one of this guy's guards is Daniel Salazar. Yes, he survived the villa fire and ended up befriending the water resistance. When this guy finds out Daniel was a death squad killer, he recruits him for security. But Daniel kills this guy and sides with the water queen who's distributing water more fairly to the people. So as Madison's negotiating a deal for the water, there's trouble back at the ranch cause a zombie horde is coming right to it. Yes, Troy did not accept the peace between the ranch and the reservation. So he's luring this horde here to destroy the whole thing. It's a big old zombie fight, but the ranch is destroyed and Alicia is the sole survivor. But unfortunately, Ophelia was bit and as Daniel's about to be reunited with his daughter, he's minutes late to say goodbye. Meanwhile, Madison finally learns it was Troy who led the zombies to the ranch. And it's a tragic situation as Troy kind of wants to be a good boy for his new mother figure. But Madison realizes he's too much of a loose cannon and no, she kills him. But things are looking up for Madison Clark, who's got a new safe home here at the dam. Unfortunately, the motorcycle gang that runs the bazaar, the Proctors, is coming to take it right now. And they have an inside man, cause Victor Strand cut a deal with him. And as he and Daniel fight it out, oh, he shoots Daniel in the face. It goes through though, so he's okay. So as Proctor John takes the dam, Victor's deal was for him and the Clark's safety, but for some reason, that deals off. But Nick has the detonator to blow the whole thing up. Yeah, new deal, my family goes free. And now Nick decides, screw it. Yes, he blows up the dam, frees the river to the people. And so after a pretty great third season, Fear the Walking Dead is finally hitting its stride. I'm excited for what new adventures await the Clark family in this interesting Mexicali region. But in season four, the show has a soft reboot with a new main character, Morgan Jones, crossing over from the main show. When Rick Grimes met him in season one, he was a normal guy, but in season three, when his wife and son died, he went crazy and started killing everyone. Later, he made a friend who taught him the art of peace, so now he doesn't kill anyone. But he had to kill during the Savior War, and he took it too far, started killing everyone. So now Morgan's living by himself in the dump. He's like, yo, Rick, I gotta leave the group and go find myself. And so he pulls a Forrest Gump and just starts running, runs himself all the way to Texas. His first friend here is John Dory, a real life cowboy who was a professional trick shot artist. They befriend Al, who's got this big SWAT truck with epic guns built in. She was a reporter and is still going around filming people, getting the scoop on the zombie apocalypse. They find someone who needs help and it is Alicia Clark, but oh, it's a trap. Yes, our old crew ambushes this new one. But very quickly they turn it around and Al interviews them to find out how they ended up this way. After Mexico, the Clark family made it to Texas where they settled in an old baseball stadium. Things were great for a while. Luciana came back without explanation, but one night a group arrived and menacingly just sat there. They're called the vultures because they don't attack. They just wait for settlements to fail, then scavenge the remains. And indeed the stadium is falling because they got weevils in their crops. Our group manages to find some new seeds and replant, but then the vultures bust in a bunch of zombies and oh, the stadium's overrun. Madison's kids are stuck outside the walls. And so she lights a flare and lures all the zombies inside, then locks the gate to the stadium and sets it on fire, sacrificing herself to save her kids. 
happens. So in the present, Nick finds one of the vultures. Morgan tries to stop him. Hey, killing's bad, but Nick doesn't listen, kills this guy. But then immediately, Nick is shot. Oh, by Charlie, the little girl who's with the vultures, and the cycle of violence continues. So Nick Clark, one of the best, most complex characters in the Walking Dead universe, gets a tear-jerking death. So the group hunts down the rest of the vultures, but one of them is this woman, June, who turns out was John Dory's girlfriend. He was living a lonely life in his cabin, but one day he met June and they fell in love, but then she was scared and ran off. So Alicia wants to kill her, but Morgan's not gonna let that happen, gives her the speech, killing is bad. And turns out Al had interviewed Madison when they were separated earlier, I guess. She talked about how she hoped her kids wouldn't lose themselves in the zombie apocalypse, and so it gets through to Alicia and we're all friends now. Morgan's not planning to stick around, he's gonna go back to Virginia. But on the way, at a rest stop, he meets a couple truckers, Sarah and Wendell, and they're still cruising the highways, helping people by dropping off supply boxes, take what you need, leave what you don't. Turns out though, they just stole this truck from the guy who was really doing it, Polar Bear. But Morgan convinces them to change their ways, and now they're going around doing it for real. Pretty soon they recruit the rest of the group, so Morgan and friends have a new mission. They're Texas trucker helper people. Now Texas is a big place, so at this point the show becomes mostly just characters talking to each other over the walkie. And the show becomes a huge snooze fest as nothing really happens, except when weird stuff happens, but honestly I stopped paying attention. At one point there's a massive hurricane, and Alicia takes shelter with the vulture girl Charlie. But she's been infected with Morgan's no killing, so she doesn't get revenge for her brother, and instead these two become best friends. And if you're wondering what the heck Alicia's holding, at a water park, she found a machine gun, but then the case came off. She sharpened that into a point, and it's become her new signature zombie killing weapon. The main villain of this part of the show is this random dirty hobo lady who's mad, I guess, that our group's trying to help people. She starts sabotaging them, and our group can't just kill her because they don't kill people. The big climax is when she poisons them, but earlier they met a brewer. He ended up dying, but Morgan brings in the Augie's Ale beer truck, and turns out beer is the cure for poison. June is a nurse, so it's medically sound. So the day is saved, and our group's free to keep driving around Texas, talking on walkies, and helping people. So in season five, our group gets a call for help from the other side of Texas, and apparently they can't drive there because the roads are out, so they fly a plane while well, they crash a plane. But don't worry, they're fine. We're here to help. But turns out it was a fake call from this other trucker, Logan, who was Polar Bear's old partner and used to live here, and came up with an excuse to get them all out. So half our group stranded on the other side of Texas, and there's someone here who's marking their territory by stringing zombies together. Turns out it is a feral group of kids, but Morgan gives them a talking to, and our group adopts a bunch of children. While they're working to fix their plane, John and June go to the old western town where he worked as a gunslinger, and here they meet Dwight crossing over from The Walking Dead. Remember, he was one of Negan's top guys, but he switched sides to help our group. He's looking for his wife Sherry, who ran away from Negan, but left him the clue, the beer and pretzels, forever honeymoon, and he's followed her trail all the way to Texas. But now he's trapped, and there's two zombies left, and John Dory's only got one bullet, so he has Dwight hold up the axe for the trick shot, the San Antonio split, wow, splits the bullet. Then rejoining the show is Daniel Salazar, who's pretty mad at Strand for shooting him in the face. But he forgives him, he's a nice old man now who's adopted a cat, Skidmark. Strand wants to borrow his plane to rescue their friends, but the plane breaks. But Strand finds another flying vehicle, yes, the Augie's Ale hot air balloon. This show's gone off the rails. But something important happens for the wider Walking Dead universe as Althea finds a soldier from the Civic Republic military. Yes, the mysterious supergroup with the three ring logos that has the helicopters that took Rick Grimes. Al is captured by one of their soldiers and they're real serious, supposed to shoot people on sight. But her helicopter's out of fuel, so she needs Al's help to climb the mountain and get more. And now they've bonded, so she breaks protocol. Instead of killing her, they start making out. But the big problem on this side of Texas is radiation. As the scientist Grace explains, the nuclear power plant is melting down down. So they fix the plane just on time to escape the nuclear apocalypse for now. So back on the good side of Texas, we've got a found footage thing going on as our group's filming a documentary on how they're helping people and leaving it in VCRs at rest stops, I guess. They make some new friends like this random rabbi and this guy Wes who's been painting trees and inspires Alicia to paint trees too. But driving around Texas takes a lot of gas and it seems like our crew has an infinite supply. Turns out they found an oil refinery called Tank Town and they're using zombie power to drill for oil. Cool. But remember Logan, he's still around, and now his crew comes to take it. But what's this? They're all killed by a bigger group who ride around on horses, led by red-haired Virginia. She and her rangers are consolidating Texas under her rule, and our group's all invited to join. The problem is, she doesn't help everyone, she only accepts people who add value to the group. So Morgan rejects her, we're gonna keep doing things our way, and so she makes her own documentary, and for a while we got Warren documentaries. This one dude in Morgan's group is so dedicated, he keeps filming when the bridge collapses and has the dumbest death in The Walking Dead. 
Virginia did take Tank Town, though, and so with their group out of gas, they're walking to another community, but it's all overrun with zombies. So they have to give up. All right, Virginia, we'll join you. But then they realize they can just lure the zombies out of there, and they fix up this town, and John and June get married. But Virginia was already on her way, so she crashes the wedding, and now joining her is not optional. Just to be mean, she separates our whole group, sending them off to her different communities. But Morgan Jones is staying here. He's a leader that could undermine her rule, so she's got to kill him. But before she can finish him off, she gets a call that Grace is pregnant. Yes, all season she thought she was dying of radiation poisoning, but turns out pregnancy has the same symptoms. And Morgan and Grace have fallen in love, but actually the baby's not his that was from the other guy she was dating before. Anyway, now that he's going to be kind of a father, Virginia doesn't kill him and leaves him there to bleed out. But in season six, Morgan does not bleed out. He meets a new friend who has a safe place to live behind a dam. Yeah, the lake is dried up, so there's a whole hidden valley here. But now a cool axe-wielding bounty hunter is after Morgan. Virginia sent him to finish the job. And he's not scared of Morgan because he watched the documentary about how he doesn't kill people. And so to stop this guy, Morgan has to kill again. He attaches this guy's axe to his staff to represent that now he can kill when he has to. So Morgan resolves to build a new community here and rescue all his friends from the villainous Virginia. Of course, Virginia is not a bad villain. In most of her settlements, life is pretty good. But undesirables are put on zombie killing duty. And when they're overrun to save himself, Strand injures this guy and throws him to the horde. And for his ingenuity, Strand is promoted. Virginia makes him one of her rangers. Al and Dwight are sent out scouting. And who does Dwight finally find but his long-lost wife, Sherry. Oh, forever honeymoon reunited. But she's made friends with the Virginia Resistance group of people that she cast out. So Dwight joins them and they do a big heist to get the SWAT truck back. Now we meet Virginia's little sister, Dakota, who wants to join our group because she thinks her sister is evil. But John Dory was investigating a murder cover-up and turns out Dakota was the killer. She's a messed up little kid. And now, in fact, she shoots John Dory. What? His nurse wife, June, is here to help. But oh, she's too late. John Dory dies. But now Virginia Virginia wants her sister back, so she's going to execute our group if Morgan doesn't return her. She wants Strand to pull the trigger to prove his loyalty, but Victor Strand has used his smooth-talking skills to get half the Rangers on his side. Oh, it's a coup against Virginia! Blam, blam, blam! So Morgan offers Virginia asylum. Everyone else wants her executed, but Morgan doesn't kill her. He dramatically thrusts his axe into the ground. No more killing anymore. Again. But June blames Virginia for John Dory's death, and she kills her. Oh, and now June's banished from the group. But the rest of our group is all together again, living happily in Morgan's Hidden Valley. And if they start raising horses, they can call it Morgan's Hidden Valley Ranch. But a new bad group starts sabotaging them, and they like to graffiti, the end is the beginning. They're a doomsday cult living in a bunker, and their leader is the charismatic weirdo Teddy. Meanwhile, June found a random old man, who turns out is none other than John Dory Sr. And Teddy is the serial killer that he was hunting when he was a cop. Wow, Texas is a really small world. And they found a beach to nuclear submarine. So Teddy's plan is to nuke all of Texas and end the world even more. So Morgan and Strand bust in to stop him, but they're overrun. Strand's like, hey, Morgan, you're willing to sacrifice yourself to save the world, right? Because I'm not. And he pushes Morgan into the zombies to save himself. But Morgan survives. So now things between them are awkward. But they're still too late. Teddy launches the missiles. Dakota, by the way, had joined Teddy, but long story short, now she realizes he's a fraud, so she kills him. But the nuke's already launched, so yes, it's happening. Boom! Nuclear apocalypse Texas time. Magically, our group all somehow found bunkers. Uh, Alicia, in fact, was put in Teddy's main one. In fact, most of our gang was picked up by a helicopter. Yeah, Al called her Civic Republic girlfriend to give him a lift. They don't fly to the Civic Republic, though. She just drops them outside the blast radius. And pretty soon after, Al leaves the group to live happily ever after with her helicopter girlfriend. Morgan and Grace did not find a bunker. Uh, they just hid under a truck, which I guess works. And by the way, yeah, they've got a baby, but it's not Grace's baby. Hers didn't make it. It's another random baby who they named Morgan and named Morgan the Godfather. Victor Strand didn't find a bunker, he found an apartment, so he figured this was the end. But this building turns out to be just outside the blast radius, and Victor Strand now believes he's on the right path. So in season seven, it's the nuclear apocalypse in the zombie apocalypse. And everyone's adjusted really quick, managed to make radiation suits and stuff. But they can't leave Texas because of where the bombs dropped. It's penning them in. They're all stuck here. But right in the middle is the safe zone of Victor Strand's tower. Strand has adopted a new style, now dressing in dictator chic. And he's become a dictator, making the hard choices to keep this place safe, executing anyone who doesn't support him. But he only lets in those with useful skills. Even half our old group, he sends them packing. And Morgan especially, he doesn't want in after their awkwardness on the sub last season. 
reason, but he does accept baby Mo and sort of keeps her as a hostage. Alicia was in Teddy's bunker, but with Teddy dead, she kind of takes over. Now this was a real government bunker where a senator was hiding before he died, but she befriends his aide who's still alive and he has files about a safe place padre, more on that later. But now tragically, Alicia is bit. She amputates her arm, but she was too late. She still got the zombie fever. It seems to be slowed down though. She's okay for a while. So she straps her arm bone back onto herself and makes it her new signature weapon. Now Strand likes Alicia, he's gonna let her in, but when she finds out he killed her senator's aide boyfriend, she's like, you become the villain, Victor. This means war. But they can't attack the tower with baby Mo inside. So it's John Dory Sr. who suits up in armor to get her out of there and sacrifices himself. So Alicia leads the group in an assault on the tower. Wes had joined Team Strand, but now he betrays him to take over. So Strand kills Wes to save Alicia. Then in Alicia and Strand's final fight, they burn the tower down so no one gets it. And so with nowhere safe left in Texas, the rest of our group takes to the sea. Alicia hallucinates a bird, which makes her realize she forgives Strand and sends him off to join him while she stays behind to die of zombie fever. Except she doesn't though, I guess she's fine. Now Morgan made it to Louisiana, and who does he meet here but Madison Clark? After all this time, they brought her back. She survived the stadium fire, but inhaled a lot of smoke, so now she needs an oxygen tank, and she's picked up a new signature weapon, a gigantic sledgehammer. But now she kidnaps little Mo. Yeah, she's working as a baby snatcher for a group called Padre. But when Morgan tells her he was friends with her kids, although I'm sorry to say they're both dead now, but now she's willing to turn on Padre and help him get his daughter back. So in season eight, Padre is on a hidden island that was originally a military safe zone, and they are successfully keeping kids safe, but they're kind of brainwashing them. You don't need your parents, you just need Padre. Now Padre himself hides behind two-way glass and only communicates over the speaker. Morgan and Madison try to rescue Mo, but it seems like they failed, Madison's captured. This one girl finds Madison and helps her escape, but soon Madison realizes this is baby Mo. It's been a seven year time jump to catch up with the Walking Dead Prime. So Madison helps Mo escape again, but when they find Morgan, he's working for Padre. Padre. Yeah, he and Grace decided that Padre could keep Mo safer than they could, and so have let her grow up without them in her life. But this woman, Shrike, is the Padre leader who's not behind the glass, and she can't risk Mo meeting her parents again, so she tries to kill Morgan, he's gotta escape. Dwight and Sherry have been working for Padre too, they took the same deal cause they have a son now. But now they bring him to June cause he needs medical attention, but June had left Padre cause they were making her do experiments, having people bit on purpose and blasting them with radiation. Inspired by how Alicia survived so long, they think radiation might be the key to the zombie cure. And now Shrike captures them all, and with the zombie head, mounted on the crane arm has their son bit. So June will have to resume the experiments in hopes to save his life. But now Shrike's captured by the Padre resistance of disgruntled parents who have been formed into a guerrilla commando crew by Captain Daniel Salazar. By the way, his main plot in season six and seven was that he's old now, he's got dementia, but he's been drinking ginkgo tea and so he's cured now. So they break the glass to meet the real Padre who turns out is Shrike's brother. Their father was the original Padre commander, but when he died in front of them, they were real sad and they decided that kids are better without their parents so they don't have to be sad when their parents die. Meanwhile, Morgan and family have gotten away. They've gone all the way to Atlanta to his house from season one where he met Rick Grimes. He wanted to face his demons and lay to rest his wife and son so that he and his new family can live happily ever after. But just then, oh no, it's a zombie attack and Grace is bit. So they boat all the way back to Padre in the hopes the radiation cure can heal her because it seemed to work on Dwight and Sherry's son. But it doesn't last, it just slowed it down a little and he does die. So Grace has her tearful farewell with Morgan in the style of the show over the walkie. But now Morgan starts writing clear on the walls again. Yeah, he goes crazy like Walking Dead season three when he's blacking out and trying to kill everyone. But soon he gets himself under control and in the final showdown with Padre, he gives the big speech and the power of love wins the day. Except for Shrike who was awful and June kills her. Now it's time for Morgan to say goodbye. He's going back this time to actually meet up with his original Walking Dead friends. He tries to call his old friend Rick Grimes. Hey man, if you're out there, I'm coming to find you. And so Morgan Jones with his daughter Morgan set off on a another adventure. Madison Clark is staying behind, gonna turn Padre into a good place. But now we catch up with Victor Strand, who's inexplicably speaking German with a new hot boyfriend and an adopted son. But now Madison Clark has tracked him down. Yes, old best friends reunited. But a new bad group has followed her here, led by none other than Troy Otto. Yeah, they're bringing everyone back. Yeah, he survived Madison's hammer to the head, and now he's here for revenge and to take over Padre. And his revenge on Madison has already begun because he killed Alicia. To take down Troy, they need some more allies. So they find Luciana, who's still trucking around, taking up Polar Bear's old mantle. Working with her is Charlie, who survived the radiation. And Madison finally learns she's the one who killed Nick. But Troy takes her hostage, gonna trade her for Padre's location. But Charlie breaks free and to make up for Nick and save Padre, she now kills herself. But then our crew takes a kid prisoner. It's this girl, Tracy, who is Troy's daughter. And she's like, Madison, you killed my mom. 
mom? Wait, what? I didn't know your mom. Turns out Delisha rescued them and inspired Troy's wife to try to help people, which got her killed. And because Madison was the one who told Alicia to help people, Troy blames Madison. But now Madison and Troy are captured by the Padre brother. They gotta work together to escape across this bridge, which obviously is not a good escape plan. But now they've had a heart to heart. Troy's like, I'm sorry, let's be friends. But Madison, oh, doesn't forgive him. She kills him again. But now Troy drops a new truth bomb. Tracy isn't his daughter. It's Alicia's daughter who he kidnapped. So now Madison wants to protect her granddaughter, but it's like, yo, you just killed my dad and she shoots her. And now to avenge Troy, his gang wrangled up a zombie horde and unleashed it at Padre. So things look bleak, our crew surrounded, but Madison Clark survived. The bullet hit Alicia's lucky necklace. So Madison Clark runs over there and does what she does best, leads all the zombies inside so all the people can escape and lights the whole place on fire. Everyone assumes she's dead for real this time, except she's not. Tracy pulled her out of the rubble. And now coming to join them is Alicia, who's also alive. Troy stabbed her, but she recovered, and now mother and daughter are reunited. Madison's excited to be a grandma, but Alicia's like, I don't have a kid. Troy knows Madison protects her own family, so he lied about that so she would protect her. So now they go to check on their friends, who are back to their old ways trucking around. But now in honor of Madison's sacrifice, they've renamed Padre to Madre. But Padre is a smoking ruin, so our crew has no home base. Dwight has an idea to go back to the sanctuary, yeah, Negan's old fortress. He randomly went back there earlier this season and took out the new gang that was living inside. He's like, we should take it and make it a good place, so he and Sherry are gonna try that. The rest of the group is splitting up for now, just hanging with their closest loved ones. But as Strand's heading off with his new German family, he sees the Clark girls in the rearview mirror, and it's a tearful farewell as he realizes what they're doing. Their deaths have inspired the group more than their lives would. And they decide they're gonna go to check out their old home of Los Angeles. And that's where Fear the Walking Dead comes to an end. If you liked this recap, hit that subscribe button for more of the best recaps of TV and movies.